Yeah, we're back. That's right. Get a grip on lighting here. We're going to go dark skies here in a second with Brian Amundsen of Pacific Lamp, who is the chair of our member committee for the promotion and advancement of the five principles of responsible outdoor lighting. Yeah, that's where we're headed with this thing. But before we go there, we have another member of our vendor committee that was that we love. Yeah. And that's Keystone Technologies, Greg. You got to go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com, baby. The light made easy kings. They might be new to the outdoor lighting market, but they're not new to the lighting industry. They get lighting. They understand it. Mm. And now they're attacking the exterior market. So watch out for Keystone. Great product. Area lights, wall packs, floods, everything you need. Whatever they do, they do easy. You got to go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com. Of course, proud members of the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, Nail.org. Come on, sucker. Get associated. If you ain't in, we ain't letting, we're not letting members in anymore. It's only our tight group now. No, just kidding. Come on in if you're a lighting distributor. And if you're an individual, that's right. We just opened it up to the individuals that need to take Ellis Evolve, the greatest lighting training program ever created in the history of mankind. But for right now, Let's say hi to one of our board members, President-elect, Brian Amundsen, Pacific, uh, Pacific Lamp in Portland. What's up, Brian? How you doing, guys? Thanks for having me on today. Doing no good. Getting back after it. Yeah. So we're doing this a, pr- a little bit of a preamble with you. Brian, you know, what do you know about dark sky friendly lighting? And what do you want to know, man? Well, we know it's an initiative that uh, we would like to, to see more of. Um, it gets a little bit tricky when, when selling those products to, to clients. But I think there needs to be better standards across the board um, that, that we can follow as distributors. And I think we would see better adoption in the marketplace. You know, the demand for these products is low. and that's a very difficult hurdle for distributors because distributors aren't telling, are not in the position really to tell. It's more like you sell people what they want in a sense or what's, what's on the rebate application. Is it on the prescribed list of the QPL of the DLC? There isn't really as much. There is a little bit among some distributors. Some distributors are better than others, but a lot of distributors are just selling what people want to buy. And this is, this is why there's a barrier for us. Where do you want to take this committee to get over that hump, Brian? Well, what I would like to see is, is definitely more standards, um, local utilities to be able to adopt that and, and add that to their incentive offerings. Um, but obviously, obviously, that's going to have to happen with, with more regulation and standards created upstream so that will flow downstream so that guys like us can get this into the marketplace. We are seeing some calling for these products in our coastal regions, um, but standard-wise, it's uh, there hasn't been been a lot of ask for it. But I definitely like to see this um, be adopted by the the, the general public in a in a much larger um, much much larger uh, network. Have you guys done any, you had some demand for the coastal um, market or area. Have you done any projects specifically that were dark sky friendly or dark sky compliant or anything like that? We have in the, the little city of Florence, Oregon for their events center. Um, we, we were able to meet all the dark sky compliancy um, requirements for that project and a, f- and a few other um, condominium associations along the beautiful Oregon coast. Um, and it's been very successful. The projects look really good. I think it would look a lot better if we adopted more of that uh, throughout our larger cities, not just our uh, coastal communities. Were you active in that or was it one of your sales reps? Do you know? I, I, the reason I'm asking is I'd like to know kind of the ins and outs of what it took to actually meet that compliance. It was one of my sales reps. Um, but, but came from a, a, an outreach uh, gentleman that we have that, that uh, services our coastal communities. 
So it was, uh, I helped work on it. Um, I don't know the exact details of what those requirements were. I do believe that they were 3,000 Kelvin um, lights and we, we had to have glare shields. But something just came to came up that I forgot about. I'm actually working on all the ski run lighting at one of our ski resorts here in Oregon. And we had to meet with the, uh, the tribal community to, to get that approved. And we are also using glare shields and 3000 Kelvin lighting to meet all of their dark sky compliances act. So we don't have any light pollution um, that could disrupt the wildlife um, on beautiful Mount Hood. Who's who's directing that uh, that project? For example, is is are they telling you what they need, or are you trying to talk to them, or is somebody involved that knows and, what's needed? And is it coming from the customer, or is it coming from an ordinance by the city? Is it the First Nations tribe in the area that's asking for? Where is the where is the desire for this coming for as well as a part of Greg's question? It's coming from the Warm Springs Confederate tribe. Um, they actually own that land that the ski resort leases from. And so we had to meet their mandates, which I don't know exactly where those come from, if that's something that they have developed internally, or if that's a federal regulation that's moved downstream to them. But, but I do know that we had to meet um, with the, the, uh, uh, the tribes uh, committee and get our uh, light fixtures approved. And, um, we were able to do so, and we're now in the going on third phase of uh, converting all of their high pressure sodium and metal halide ski run lights to LED. And how difficult was it finding an LED that had enough lumens and uh, 3000 Kelvin? It was a little bit difficult. Um, the manufacturer that, that we chose was RAB. Um, because of the robust design of their FX Flood series, and they were able to meet all the requirements that we needed um, in, in order to get approval from um, the board of uh, Warm Springs Confederate Tribe. Another great nail member there, Rab Lighting. Um, when you guys were, uh, when did did the did the tribes people and the people involved in this did they seem to have a sense of the need for this darkness and the need for these shields more than? You know, when you encounter regulations and it seems kind of like um, lighting accounting in a way, it's like you have to follow or was there, was there some passion there behind these people saying, look, this is about wildlife. This is about restoring dark skies. This is about, you know, the, a greater good. What, was it was it that or was it more of a compliance scenario? I would say a little of both. I mean, they're, they're very passionate about the wildlife. Um, obviously, we have some beautiful nature reserves here in the Pacific Northwest. And also, it was just, you know, compliance from the actual tenants view. You know, they were just looking for something that's less maintenance than their um, current lighting system because they were going on 60 foot wood poles. And, you know, imagine changing a, a ballast when it's uh, snow on the ground. It's pretty, pretty difficult. But. Um, it was definitely a little of both concern over the wildlife and what that's going to be doing with, you know, the various bird species and, and, and what have you. But um, uh, it, was, it was definitely f for the need to meet the requirements that were set into the into that leased contract between the tribe and the ski resort. Were the fixtures you installed DLC rated? Yes, sir. At 3000 Kelvin, they, they made DLC? It says DLC on the spec sheet, so yeah. I didn't actually look up the part number uh, of that particular Kelvin temperature. I'm with but, you. Uh, I, I do the same thing as does everyone else. <laughs> so DLC uh, on the spec sheet, well, you would assume that uh, all the part numbers incorporated in that spec sheet would be DLC listed. That's my yep. answer. And how was the rebate on that? Was there a rebate, I assume? The rebate in 2020 was phenomenal. The second phase this year got cut back um, due to budget constraints with the Energy Trust of Oregon due to uh, blowing their budget out of the water by 60 plus percent due to bonus rebates that we didn't necessarily need during the pandemic. Interesting how that works, huh? Yeah. Before we get in, Mike might have to have a little tangent on that, but before we do, was there any comment on, on reducing from 4K down to 3K? 
when you did this? Were people saying it's not as bright or have any concern over that? Yeah, the, the staff at the ski resort really would have liked to use 5,000 Kelvin um, because we had done some samples initially before they investigated into their lease about color temperature requirements. And the perceived brightness obviously is better from the 5,000 Kelvin fixtures rather than the three. So ultimately, because of the Confederate tribe and, and their requirements, we were forced to go with 3,000 Kelvin. Um, from a skier's perspective, it's not as good. From a nature perspective, it, it's a it's a win. You know, I think from a skier's perspective, if you were sitting on a ski lift and you could see the Milky Way, I probably think from a skier's perspective, it's better too. You know, I mean, I I I, I I'm not I'm not saying you're wrong, but I'm saying that there's other ways to look at things. You know, and the incorporation of a of a glorious night sky into anything will always make it better by a magnitude. And so if we can achieve that by getting better at creating lighting systems, the one thing about the 5,000K or the old scotopic, photopic argument, remember that <laughs> 10 years ago? That was a, You'd hear that word everywhere, right? Now you don't really hear it much anymore. Scotopic versus photopic. Oh, I'm smart. That's like, you know, some <laughs> industry jargon that jumped into the pantheon there. But, you know, it, it, it's interesting. You know, people, you tell them to look up at a light, and say, which one's brighter? Of course, they're going to say the white light is brighter. Of course. Mm -hmm. You know, it, look, makes the, it makes the snow look whiter or whatever. But then when you, once you do it and you're done and you use a different Kelvin temperature, especially now that with LEDs, there really isn't a big difference in things like CRI, you know, like there was with other light sources where you, you know, in the, in the days of T12, if you went with a warm white, your CRI was 60 and HPS, it's 20. You know, now the, the CRIs of lower Kelvin temperature LEDs rival those, if they're not the same, Greg Eric, as 5,000 Kelvin. And so, you know, yeah, at perceived, you know, this and that. I mean, at the end of the day, we need to start thinking about incorporating and bringing back those, those glorious night skies, Greg, to all of the, especially in places like ski resorts and mountains. And that's where you want to see that stuff, man. I'm hot for that. No, you're right. So um, on this, uh, and I'm, I'm diving into this application because it's interesting. I haven't actually had ever done a project that needed, uh, well, I shouldn't say ever, but dark sky compliance to that degree. I've had people say, oh, yeah, dark sky friendly, you know, put a shield on it or whatever. And that's kind of what it sounds like this is, but the Kelvin temperature for sure. Because when I've done it, it's been 4K or 5K and you put a shield on it. This is shielded and 3K. Um when you did the glare shields, did that affect the light output? That did you do one without and then add it, or how did that work out? Yeah, the first round we did without glare shields, and they actually came back and, and, and looked at it. So we had to add glare shields to those, and then this um, the second and third rounds we, we've done their glare shields. We've just done a an eight degree shield, which has worked out good. The fifteen degree shield was a little overkill because it really mess with the beam patterns and the layout that we had um, specified for the for the lighting. We're basically using three heads per pole, one shooting down the tree line, and then two um, shooting broad, wide floods across the ski slope so that we can get full coverage. Um, and so far, we've done one entire spotty lighting here and here and there, but one entire um, run and it's uh it, it's night and day compared to um the, the traditional hid lighting it's it, it's perceived really well and it looks really really good at night uh, i personally am okay with the 3000 kelvin um just some of the feedback we got from the staff is they wish they would have had five but i think ultimately it turned out really well they're saving a tremendous amount of energy they've lowered their maintenance costs um and, and everybody's happy. So it's definitely a win-win. And from that experience, has that changed how you've approached any other exterior projects that you look at now and say, you know, maybe I should consider lower Kelvin or glare or anything like that? Um, Somewhat. I mean, 5,000 Kelvin is still better, in my opinion, for 
security cameras and overall security of a facility. Watch it. Um, <laughs> but but we do we we do look at things differently, and 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 you know whatever we can do to not pollute. Uh, the planet, I think, is a good thing to do. And, and the more adoption that we can get on a broader spectrum, the more incentives we p- potentially could get and things like that are really going to help push this sector of lighting. And I, I think it's important as we grow and we continue to develop land and move farther and farther out into the outreaching uh, land, we, we need to do our part to make sure that we're not polluting the sky. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. and. Um, you know, depending on the client, we, we do get asked for warmer color, color temperatures. So it's definitely changing the way that we think. Yeah. And I think, you know, in terms of this ever, ever taking off, and I know that's what this committee is going to probably dive into, but is making it easier for manufacturers to achieve dark sky compliancy and then incentivizing people to sell it, you know, giving them more of a rebate if it's dark sky, then for sure. It's going to change totally change how you approach a project. At least me. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here and just maybe do like turn this into more of a, rather than an interview. I think I think I understand where you're gonna go with your committee, Brian. And um, you know, I can feel that there's cautious optimism from you that we can do a lot of good as we continue to sell lights, which is what you know. The I I'm I'm not into the you know humans are bad crowd. I think we can do better and we can make things really good especially with the technologies that we have but how important are like there's no incentive for the utilities to give incentives here you know like they're the traditional idea that um we're trying to lower the the demand on the grid and so we're going to use conservation demand management instead of having to build new power plants or whatever right that argument's not here um Where could, because, and the other problem I I see, so there isn't that traditional demand for utilities to fund this. And there isn't the the idea that um, people are changing lights. I mean, if there's one thing that customers in Ontario know is that there's rebates for changing your lights. They don't know what they are exactly, but they know that their buddy got a rebate and this guy got a rebate. And the last time I went to High Bay Fluorescent, I got a rebate. So uh, how fundamental do you guys think rebates are to achieving the goals of the five principles of, of responsible outdoor lighting? Like, Greg, why don't you go first? How important are rebates? In important incentive? are rebates for the five. Yeah, um, to achieve that. I think at this point, because everything, not everything, but so much of lighting sales rely on rebates, it's very important. Because right now, if, if you don't have the rebate for it and you, in a lower Kelvin temperature, for example, and you do in the higher Kelvin, guess what's going to sell? The cheaper product in the higher Kelvin temp. You can't, you're not going to be able to convince the end user otherwise, unless they're forced to or unless they pay less, in my opinion. Sorry. Brian. Yeah, I concur with, with Greg on the importance of, of rebates. Um, they obviously drive our markets. Uh, I think that things can be over incentivized. I think more of an even keel program is, is what we need as us lighting folks want. We, you know, we, we don't want big hills and, and large valleys. I mean, we want something that's pretty smooth. So I think for to get all the early bleeding edge adopters on board as far as dark sky compliancy fixtures go, is definitely going to have to be some some larger rebates on the front end, and, and how they're going to do that, I don't know because typically it's based on you know saving energy. So um, it's going to have to be something that I think comes downstream from more of a federal level, and then to a state level. You know, like right now in Oregon, we have certain programs that are really good for schools. Those are state level incentives on top of utility rebates. So. I think something like that would be a driving factor if we can get our states involved that, hey, this is better ultimately for Oregonians or Washingtonians or wherever state you're from. That's the level that we're going to need to see this at, um, that we're creating a better environment for the people that live in these communities. There's got to be some free cash to get this thing to happen. 
Okay, and I got another idea, but I'm going to throw my thing. Isn't there like some Build Back Better thing, $1.9 trillion floating around, um, coming out of uh, Joe Biden's wallet, or he was stroking the check or something like that, that I heard about? I'm a Canadian, but I heard like $1.9 trillion is a lot of cash, brother. Like all the lighting That's industry for electric needs. Vehicles. <laughs> all the lighting industry needs is like, I don't know, maybe a percentage of that, 1% or something, and we could do a ton for this five principles. How do we get some of that cash? Be sloshing around everywhere. Does anyone have we any need ideas? The leader, I, I do. The leader of the lighting industry to step up and take charge. Oh, who's that? <laughs> Yikes. It's the IES, right. but I mean, I think, you know, I don't know if they have a government relations committee, do they? If they did, they should, right. the, if they did, they should stop everything they're doing and immediately Get their hooks into that 1.9 trillion right now. Immediately say, if you want to build back better, you got to build back darker. What are you talking about? Yeah, we need darkness, brother. Okay. And so then you get your hooks into some of that cash. It starts flowing down, scrape it off. We'll scrape, 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 scrape. Next thing you know, people get a hundred bucks for, uh, you know, whatever, per fixture on a dark sky system. The other essential factor is you guys know any hipsters? You have a friend who's yeah. a hipster? We got to get the hipsters sure. on board. Like, you know those guys that are always on the front lines of everything that's cool? Like, to get those guys on board with the dark sky. Because they'll be like, yeah, we don't even do dark sky. Like, there needs to be, like, some revulsion towards the 5,000K glare bomb. Like, from the bottom level, at the level of people. And it starts with those hipster guys. Or those, like, people on the fringes that are, like, super cool. I don't know. I don't know if they're cool. I don't know if cool is the right word to describe. But you guys know what I'm talking about. Like, there needs to be, like, a group, a fringe group. That just dives in whole hog like vegans. You know, do like you know that, who, that shame you know people Brian, that don't do this. You know what I mean? You know where Brian lives, right? Yeah, he lives in Oregon. It's like the headquarters of it. That's why Portland. I said it. That's the headquarters. Oh, wait, <laughs> listen, Minnesota, Minnesota's got a lot of hippies too, bro. I hate to yeah, tell yeah, you. Minnesota's yeah, got no, a good, good dose of them too. So was Colorado. You know, that whole kind of bandy thing along there. They all moved from California to Idaho. You know what I'm saying? How do we get those peeps on board with this? So we can make a ton of money. We sure. accept cryptocurrency and Bitcoin for payment. Simple. There you go. <laughs> that, but that might really might be it. Oh man, That's accept funny. crypto and you're in. <laughs> we need someone like but, we need we need someone like to go start shaming people on Twitter or something on on our on the, the behalf of the lighting industry. Like, Got to go dark skies. Yeah, we're right over here, bro. Ready for you, man. Got them in stock. We Maybe that's that. the first step of Brian's committee. Maybe. Hipsters okay. on board. Get those hipsters you going. Know. Well, we're going to work you it, know. but I, I, you know what? That's what we need. We need to build like a, a group of citizens who aren't in the lighting business, but are into being at the front end of everything environmental, everything green, everything whole foods, everything, you know, all those, I'll eat a pig's eye. Yeah. See, you eat the whole animal in Portland. You eat the whole pig. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we don't, we don't waste anything here. How come you charge so much for a pig's eye? I thought it was garbage. No, no. Here, it's $15 an eye. And it's special. It's broiled like a, a, a poached egg for you. Ooh, it tastes gross. Yeah, you eat it, sucker. We need those people, man, to get super dark sky crazy. That's what we need. Starving for darkness is meant to do that. Final point. Safety. Now, I know, listen. There's real safety from lighting outdoor, okay? Like, it's, you know, people that say that, you know, there's no factor of safety. How do we get this thing to go from, right now it's ridiculous. Like, the perception of lighting, glare bomb, and safety, that's very difficult. To, it's, if you have a customer that wants to do outdoor lighting for safety reasons, there's no chance they're doing anything with shields, anything low Kelvin temperature. They want a prison yard. How do that, you're, you're saying that has to be regulated. Is there another way that we can get around this safety argument? Go first, Brian. Well, first, we just have to look at each site accordingly. You know, what we can do is make sure that we're adding motion sensors, bi-level sensors. You know, those are going to add security features. So regardless of color temperature, you know, if your lights are at 20% and a fee for whomever comes onto your property that transient that wants to occupy your, your loading dock, 
you're gonna scare them off or at least have some level by the lights ramping up to a hundred percent. So, you know, that's, that's one thing. Um, I really don't think color temperature has that much to do. It's more of a per- perceived safety rather than an actual. Um, so we just have to educate people that, that color temperature, whether it be white or whether it be warm, is still going to give you the same level of safety. It's just getting all your lights working, making sure your outdoor lighting is designed properly, that you have the amount of coverage. That's, that's what you see the lack of, especially in retrofit applications. We're seeing a good job on the new construction market here in Portland, um, but but the retrofit market is, is huge. And a lot of the projects being done um, aren't, aren't being done with any kind of dark sky uh, compliancy um, in that conversation. Reggie. Yeah, I think it all has to come from regulation still. I mean, and, and to Brian's point, that's where I was going to go is controls. You know, having the varying light levels is more secure than having a lot of light levels, in my opinion. Is if you have it, you have a dim, then all of a sudden you're in and it's boom, now you're full. That, that, that's like an alert. That's an alarm in a way. Versus that, that scares the crap out of level. people. Like if yes. someone comes to your house and they walk on the porch and the lights come on, they're like, whoa. They, it yeah. freaks them out. Like I, I have sensors mm-hmm. on my porches and stuff like that. And they walk up, boom, all of a sudden more lights come on. Whoa, what, where am I? Somebody's real serious yeah. here. Did someone turn yeah. on those lights? Is there someone watching me? Like sensors are at increased the effectiveness of outdoor security lighting by a magnitude. If somebody walks into a space and the lights all of a sudden come on, they're going to run away. Nine out of 10 guys yeah. are gone. Right away. Who cares about that. energy savings? This is more about security to me. Lighting, outdoor lighting controls are more about that, even though they have the energy savings. The only thing I would say is this. The only thing I would say is this. That, that hot blast of on and off can be very damaging from a light trespass perspective. You know what I'm saying? For like street mm-hmm. lighting. And if you have a neighbor, if that all of a sudden a 250 watt LED light comes on, that's going to be smashing into someone's window. Like they're wake them up even, you know what I mean? So I think that we need to build sensor systems that are sort of like a, that come on to 30% and then slowly go up. You know what I mean? Like the sensor trips it, but it doesn't trip it to full. It trips it to like 30% and then goes up. And then when it goes off, it also goes off over the course of 90 seconds or a minute or something like that. So it's not like boom, boom, ba boom, off and on. But man, I, I really think that lighting controls can properly well done lighting controls in the exterior can actually massively increase the safety if they're left off and someone gets, or they're at a dim level or they're partially on. And then when the, when, when um, the potential burglar or whatever enters the space, boom, the lights come on. That's a hundred percent. Right. Brian, that's a, Great point. So, I mean, I, I think your your um, your uh, members can discuss that. Any final thoughts for us, Brian? Yes, yeah, Watt Stopper a nailed member? Because if they're not, that'd be a good one we could get on our team. Everyone should be and, a nailed uh, member. <laughs> yeah, that's our go to as far as outdoor. You're talking about ramping down and fading yeah. out, and a very versatile uh, product. Uh, is I believe it's their S- FSP product, and we use that as a photo cell as well as motion sensor or, or combination of both. And because of the versatility in that, and you know, speaking of security, we just got done with a local Infinity dealership that was having some some break in problems here, um, which has ramped up significantly because of the pandemic. So we added a bunch of different max light fixtures with that watt stopper sensor. It's been really successful. They've had less break ins, less theft. Um, so that, that's a great product, but, uh, yeah, I can crew with both of you guys. It's all about how these sensors are programmed, the lighting layout done on the exterior. And we're going to see the same level of, uh, of security with warm light or cool light. We just need to get the adoption levels higher. So we just need to, to build this committee and see what we can do to, uh, to get people to engage in it and, and start to put together some regulations about, um, you know, not, you know, when we talk about maximum or minimum light levels, that's what we need to talk about is how we can do this with dark sky and, and how that we can make the planet a better place for, for all of us to live in and save energy. So. There's no maximum light levels and that's a travesty. And we need to change that folks. This has been Brian Ammons and Greg, Eric and Michael Colligan on dark skies. It's a special series, but get a grip on lighting. We're not giving up. 
Um, you know, we're going to come out hot. And this is why we got all the top committees all. We're rocking and rolling, man. You know what? Because we're about getting things done. That's how we roll it nailed. We get things done. We make it happen. We don't monk around for a long time. The, the committee comes back, tells us what's up. We make it happen. That's how it goes. Why don't you join Nailed and get on one of these committees? That's right. Go to NILD.org. And of course, Greg Garrick, you got to go to KeystoneTech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. Easy like crazy. What do you got about them? Well, they're a Nailed member. And, they've, and how have they grown since they joined Nailed? Come Mike? on, man. <laughs> I'm not gonna, you know, look, Tenfold. I love Fred. Look, Fred and Josh are awesome yeah. and, and Ira and yeah. the whole crew down there. But come on, Nailed is the place to be at if you want to sell light fixtures. And we're going to make all this dark sky stuff happen. Maybe 10 years. We may need 10 years. But we're going to come out hot. Say, guy, say goodbye to the peeps, Brian and Amazon. Thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it. Go Nailed. Thanks, Fred. Talk to you soon, folks. Thanks for listening. Go pour some Bloody Marys, Greg. <laughs>